demonstrating discipleship. Now you've got to know Christ in the first place. You've got to get to know Christ. And then you've got to grow in Christ. Yeah, that's, that's crucial. That's, that's the whole thing. This, this graft happens. You, know, you graft it in and then the graft grows. And the, the, the fruit of that, the produce of that is the, you know, the service to Christ. There's fruit on the ends of the branches. And you share Christ with other people. There's more fruit. You know, it's gone viral now, isn't it? Yeah. And that leads to knowing Christ better. You've got to know about discipleship, following Christ, and demonstrating discipleship. First of all, briefly, what is Christian discipleship? It's a funny word in yellow on the board, is it? Yeah. It could be. <coughs> it could be, yeah. I think taste, I think too old. There's a noun and there's a verb there, okay? And, and what does it mean? Well, it, it relates to something in Judaism. Uh, and interestingly, the word's found 264 times in the Gospels and in Acts. It's not found in the epistles. Well, because in the epistles, Paul's gone off. Pretty much so, into a very Greek dominated world, doesn't he? Pretty much so. But there in the Gospels, you've got this pattern of understanding of rabbinical discipleship. The young fellow said to me on, on uh, Wednesday night, after coming out from the student thing, I've known him for a while, dealt with him for a while, um, and um, he was talking about what he's going to spend the rest of his life doing, whether he's going to be doing in his career that could be there for him, or whether he's going to be a minister. <laughs> Frankly, my approach to that one was, don't be a minister, <laughs> don't be a waste, go and play your whatever instrument you see, you learn that, do that, and you will open doors for the gospel, but you'll have an opportunity there, make sure you do the best of what you're learning to do that you possibly humanly can, and if God pushes you into the ministry, well he will, but you've still got it. He said, look, if I'm enough in the ministry, I'm, I'm coming to train with you. So I don't know, I meant some snide comment about you, you, you know, <laughs> the standard is high, you know, I mean, you know, the bar is set pretty high, don't, don't, don't push your luck, lads, you know. <laughs> but he's like, I can't train with you. Why? Because we've, over the years we've spoken, he's got the picture. You can learn theology in college, but you can't learn Christian ministry, except alongside some other way you stand on that one. But, I mean, a lot of people are coming to see that these days, and you don't learn Christian discipleship any other way either. The training for ministry is to train to be some sort of Christian disciple. It's the same sort of thing. If one brings another, teaches another, you learn alongside. And the whole point is that we are here in a world, the sort of world we're in, to be bringing people alongside and showing them what we're doing, demonstrating discipleship. And as they see that, and as they see what Christ is like to us, the mess that we are, they learn they want to be following Jesus too. Yeah? Most unlikely people, we need to look at us and we think, Oh dear, I'm not making a very good impression here. You know that sort of thing? This is how the deal works out. But this is my Father glorified. You bear much fruit, demonstrating, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Now there are a number of different sorts of followers of Jesus in the Gospels. It starts off with a lot of curious followers. And they come along for the ride for a bit, they're part of the big crowd and so on and so on, but then they evaporate like the morning mist, it gets difficult. You know the sort of thing? Don't see any of that going on, do we boys and girls? No, we do. Yeah, we do quite a lot. They're kind of curious. And then Jesus has got a bit further on down the road, he's, he's taught a bit more, he's given a bit of evidence, perhaps by his miracles and so on, and they're kind of convinced, really, yeah, I find that quite convincing. But they're not yet the sort of followers that Jesus is talking about here. Because once they seem kind of convinced, Jesus will give them another bit of teaching, and they say, ooh, 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 and a lot of people turn away and walk away from them. And Jesus turns to the twelve and he says, are you going as well? And Peter says, well, where else am I going to go? You got the words of eternal life. And they're the committed followers. <laughs> Do you see the pattern that's emerging? You can't just take it for granted that somebody who says, and looks initially like a follower is a disciple of Christ. Into Acts, and you find those followers further defined. They're the ones who've maybe seen the experience of Pentecost. They've seen what goes on. They've encountered the work of the Spirit of God in their own hearts and life. And then you find that the disciples are first called Christians at Antioch. And by now, disciple and Christians become the same thing committed, spiritual, spirit related disciples of Christ. Then, of course, you've got the Gentile followers that are never called disciples as such, but at Antioch, the centre of the Gentile mission as it, as it was in the day, then off, off you go, uh, you are now Christians, as it were. So what is discipleship? 
What is it? It is not being a student. And there may be a sense in which in this last 50 years in Wales we've made that mistake. Because the process of Christian discipleship has centred around the 40 minute monologue. It's only 30 minutes, but it's near the end. It's not being a student. Students learn facts and do so simply by means of oral or written verbal communication. But in any context like this, the learning model is not that of a lecture theatre, but of apprenticeship. And Paul carries that very Jewish model into his very Gentile mission across the Roman world, but without giving them the cultural overlay that goes with it. So looking after that nourishing, enlightening graph to the true vine is precisely what the thing's all about. Learning from him, being with him, apprentice to him, aspiring to be like him, modelling our lives upon him. And that's what brings us back to the point of us. What is the point of me? I was in a minister's gathering at the Westminster Fellowship many years ago with a very new young assistant minister. <coughs> and one of the old guys, one of the great hair, uh, Do you know some people in the room? Do you know some I'm old and no boys. Um, he stood up, he stood up and he said, raise the question for discussion. What use is a deacon? <laughs> and the gasp went round the room. And, I can't say that. He did. <laughs> what use is it? What is the point of a deacon? Oh, I sat there as a young man and oh, whatever, thinking I knew it. Um, thinking, yeah, what's the point of you, mate? You know, <laughs> what's the use of you? Raising a question like that. Well, the point of us is this. The point of us is to be following Jesus into his likeness as the Spirit of God works through us day by day. What's the use of a Christian? Created to be his image in the first place. Go back to Genesis chapter 1. God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. Let them rule over the fish and sea, the birds of the air. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God, or Hebrew, quite sustainable, as the image of God. An ancient came like religion has got all these little tin pot gods, you've dug them up, you know, and a couple of workers shrine at Tim there, lovely pictures on the internet, there you go, have a look. Uh, they've got these things to represent the nature and the character of what God is like. And God has created man to be that representation to his own creation of what some measure of what God is like. And the image has been spoiled because we've fallen from that image. The image has been marred and the misrepresentation of God's creation begins. And the people we meet and the kids we see around and the young farmers and the old farmers in the mud have got this misrepresentation of the image of God before them all the time. What's humanity redeemed for? What's humanity saved for? Humanity is saved biblically to be the, the redrawn poster. Mankind is made in the first place to posterize what God is like to his creation, and it's been spoiled at the fall, it's been redeemed and restored at the cross. So that the followers of Christ are there now to somehow redraw the poster and posterize the nature and the character of God again, as his character is made and shaped and formed in us by this grafting into the vine again. And by the bearing of fruit. Demonstrating a bit of what he's like. And a lot of what he can do to redeem and remake to restore the sin like humanity. So actually, your quiet time is quite important, isn't it? And maintaining that relationship with God during the day and having lots of him during the day is quite important because what it's actually doing is glorifying God and providing a model that's absolutely functional and important in the, in the redemption of the lost. Demonstrating discipleship to him, demonstrating the relationship that God brings a lost sinner into. And the nature of how his character is then rebuilt in him. Can you see how important that is? David writes me a training plan. <laughs> what? No. Bring on the chocolate biscuits and the mug of coffee, you know? No. But hang on, this is a slightly different order. God has a plan and a purpose to use ransomed and redeemed humanity by means of this abiding vine which puts the life of God flowing like sap through branches into fruit 
to glorify Him and bring the lost to see His glory.